that tide ain't going to rise if you take the money, if you uh, punish people for success. We fell off the 99%. Yes, we did. did. <laughs> we did. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we wanted to save some time for questions, but I've got a couple more things, if you don't mind, that I'd like to cover while we're, uh, we're up here before we open it to questions. One of the things I want to ask both of our speakers about is the Citizens United decision. I think we're all aware of that. In 2010, the Supreme Court overturned a century of regulation and some Supreme Court decisions in deciding that corporations' rights of free speech include their right to spend unlimited treasury dollars in political campaigns. And inherent in this decision is the concept that corporations are entitled to the rights of persons, personhood applies to corporations. Brian, what do you think of the notion of corporate personhood? And do you agree that corporations should enjoy unlimited or unregulated spending in political campaigns? I love corporate power, and I'm fully supportive of, of uh, Citizens United. Oops. Thank <laughs> 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 you, uh, I'm looking here for a quote. Here's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican. Progressive. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, and actually that's a serious comment by Carl, and it marked a turning point in the Republican Party into a party that emphasizes a business perspective from one that was, in my opinion, more broad in its goals and its views. For every special interest is entitled to justice, but no one is entitled to a vote in the Congress, to a voice on the bench, or to re representation in any public office. The Constitution guarantees protection of property, and we must make that promise good. But it does not give the right of suffrage to any corporation. There can be no effective control of corporations while their political activity remains. Now, let me get on the right page here, because you jumped, which question? Oh yeah, here we go. Citizens United decision. <clears throat> this decision reflects one more nail in the coffin of functioning representative democracy. We now have a democracy that is controlled by money. There can be no dispute about that. The amounts of money that were coming in before Citizens United are shocking. The 2010 congressional election was $3.2 billion. 80 plus percent came from less than one quarter of 1% of the American people. That's from Senator Bill Bradley, co former co-chair with former Senator Al Simpson on Americans for Campaign Reform. Al Simpson is no bleeding heart liberal. He believes that unless this, the role of money in politics is controlled and curtailed, they're proposing a public financing proposal that will pass the scrutiny of the astonishing Supreme Court we have, that we will destroy American democracy. Hamilton argued, as I said, that part of the government should be set aside permanently for the wealthy and well-born. He had in mind the Senate. Actually, he's done a pretty good job. <laughs> if you look at the average income of senators. This is aimed at something else. This is aimed at total control of all branches of government by the wealthiest people in the United States of America. Here's Abraham Lincoln. Allow all the governed an equal voice in the government, and that and that only is self-government. The founders would be appalled at the situation in which we find ourselves. Carl. So um, should corporations have personhood? <clears throat> corporations, of course a corporation is not a person. It doesn't fall in love, it doesn't have a heartbeat. But a corporation is a group of people. And I don't believe that people give up their freedom of speech by association because power does, does increase with numbers. Uh, the ability to mass behind a topic, behind a cause, behind an interest, certainly does increase your influence. And if you reduce, well, if you eliminate people's ability to associate and express speech as an association, then you will in fact dilute their power as individuals as well, not, not empowered. We spend more on potato chips than we do on national elections in this country. So yes, it does have a huge impact or it has a significant impact, 
but it's still not a significant part. Uh, it's not a significant amount of money that's going to drive our economy. That's going to drive the decisions that uh, that, that really decide where this country goes. And again, the problem is not money in politics. The problem is politics in money. If you reduce those people's ability, the seller's ability to dole out favors, there will be nobody at the cash window to give them money. That's the key to, to campaign finance reform. And then all these questions of lobbyists, of corporate dollars, and all those things will go away because there won't be any willing buyers if there's no product for people to sell. Can you can you elaborate? I'm I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the the sellers and the buyers if, in that context. If I'm a company and I want a special favor, a, sub, a tax subsidy, what am I going to do? I'm going to hire a lobbyist, <coughs> spend a lot of money on a lobbyist. I'm going to make campaign donations to the right people. I'm going to form a pack. Now I can do that. Uh, I'm going to do all kinds of things to spend money to influence who gets in place and what they do when they get there. That's because the government has the power to do that. If you remove the government's power to give me a subsidy, if you reform a tax code so that it doesn't pick winners and losers, if you get rid of mandates that force people to buy somebody's product, if you take away the government's power to pick winners and losers, people will stop, will have no incentive to pay to be on that winner's list. And you will find individuals have more power again, or groups of individuals. But again, I don't think that people give up their right to free speech just because they choose to associate themselves with an organization. The Boy Scouts are a corporation, the Girl Scouts, the YMCA, Montana Policy Institute is a corporation. People don't give up their right to free speech, they don't sacrifice their values or their freedom to enunciate their values or to act on their values or to promote their values because they associate with other people, whether it's, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit or any other group. And, and do you believe that free speech is equivalent to free uh, unlimited expenditures. I think do dollars are a way that we manifest, manifest our priorities. In, in the same way that we stand up and shake our fist and yell our opinions, we spend dollars to manifest our priorities in ways that other people <coughs> can see them and act on them. Brian? Well, uh, that's the first time you've articulated something that I would say is directly contradictory in logical terms. The idea that enterprise, like anybody else, would forego the opportunity to go to government and say, I want your help, is simply a fantasy. Unless you want to pass a constitutional amendment that says government has no business regulating or differential, that government works as government works within the, within the opportunities to build rights in the Constitution. I go back to what I said about George Washington. They picked winners and losers because they wanted to build a domestic manufacturing industry, and they were damn right to do it. You're not going to get away from that. So this idea that if government didn't have the power, I'm not, I can't paraphrase it right, is a fantasy. And you can't base policy on a fantasy. That's number one. Number two, the idea that corporations should have unlimited power to participate directly in campaigns, that's different. They already have the right to form PACs. There are PACs all over the place with corporate members. Nobody's denied anybody working for a corporation or a union the right to free speech or to donate to a corporate PAC. What this allows is treasuries from unions and corporations to contribute directly to campaigns. And it takes off with these, ind quote, independent committees, the limits. So you have guys writing five, 10, 15 million dollar checks all the time in the Republican primary. And they'll be doing it in the Democratic primary. Give me a break. You, I mean, it's, it's the real world out there. And you have a choice to make. You either go with Lincoln, that everybody, that democracy is everybody having an equal voice, or you say the rich people or the rich interests, the organized rich interests, are going to control American democracy. And they're going to control it for their purposes, like any normal person would do, with the exception that since they're corporate, as you pointed out, they're normal people. They don't have a personal conscience. They work in a marketplace of commodities and profits. I have other questions that I have. <coughs> on my list that we are prepared to address, but since we want to get out of here on time, uh, and, and we want to give everybody a chance to ask the questions, I'm going to ask each, uh, Brian and Carl, both to give a short closing statement to say anything that they want to say uh, that we've covered so far or that we haven't covered so far, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, Carl, I think you, or Brian, you went first in opening. Carl, I'm going to have you go first in closing. And I, I guess I'd ask a wrap-up question. Uh, have the founders' ideals, as you interpret them, been realized in our society? And what remains to be done, if not? 
I knew there was something left, like I wasn't going to be completely hanging out without having anything to say on that, but I can't find the page. <laughs> <laughs> Make my notes, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> it's the very last question. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if I can paraphrase your question by reading what you typed, um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been realizing to take in today's society what remains to be done. I, I think the founders, frankly, worst nightmares have come true. The power of factions to wield great power, as we have discussed, for different reasons, as as greatly it is much larger than what I think they would have envisioned with the system of checks and balances they set up. The the virtue of those who govern, the patriotism, the love of country, and the idea that they should be servants servants as opposed to masters is all that's gone in our government, in my opinion, right now, because of the ability they, because of the love that, have, that they have developed for power and because of the ability that they have to exercise power. I think equal opportunity has been replaced by equal outcomes at the expense of, of liberty, at the expense of personal freedoms. There's a balance there, don't I? I? Just because I don't think the government should grow grain doesn't mean I don't, doesn't mean that I think people shouldn't eat, all right? There is a balance in the safety net and things like that, but I think we've, we've got our, our, our uh, our priorities in a place that the founders would not recognize and certainly would not like. A government that protects us from ourselves rather than a government that protects us from each other is going to impose values on us. That takes away from freedom and those ideas of liberty that the founders had. The, uh, the ideas of federalism, of checks and balances, of personal autonomy, and even personal responsibility. Responsibility and freedom are two sides of the same coin. If you take away somebody's responsibility for the outcomes of their decisions, take away their freedom to act. I think the founders would be appalled at the balance that we have right now between those two. They've been sacrificed for the same concept or some uh, concept of, uh, of outcomes as opposed to a common good. And instead of allowing the best to flourish, which results in everybody rising, uh, I think we're imposing mediocrity on this country and we're on the wrong track. And I think they would be, again, appalled at where we are right now. I knew I had something to say. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Brian. I think we've made significant progress, not nearly enough, and we're facing a crisis, an existential crisis as far as the future of the nation. The progress I would point to is the elimination of slavery, women getting the right to vote, Indians getting the right to vote, workers getting the right to organize, senior citizens getting Social Security and Medicare to eliminate or greatly reduce the poverty of that segment of the population, used to be the highest, now is the lowest. And universal public mandatory public education so our kids get at least theoretically a fair start in a competitive society. I think more broadly we got major problems. It was a question you were going to ask on globalization. I want to point at this this out. That's a picture of humanity in National Geographic. It looks like some kind of grainy image. It's a Chinese person 28 years old. It's made up of 7,000 human figures if you come up and look at it. Each one represents 1 million people. Montana is one of the dots. That's the population of the world. The United States is 300 of the dots. China is 1,400 of the dots. India is 1,300 of the 7,000 dots. And the number of people in the world that live on less than $1.25 a day is 1,400 dots. That's the context of this discussion. <coughs> Our globalized system of capitalism has unparalleled. This is something I wrote, and I'll read it. I didn't write it for this, but I came across it. Unparalleled capacity for technological, scientific innovation producing a stunning array of consumer goods and services and generating profit and wealth. The challenge now is to figure out how to reform it so that it not only provides tremendous wealth for those at the top of the pyramid, but also provides the fundamentals for the tens of millions of Americans and for the billions around the world who